So it's great to see such a good response tonight because this is a really hot topic. There's been a lot of discussion lately about segregation, integration, desegregation, buzzwords that we've been talking about for 60 years now, at least, in public education. And I want to introduce our guests because we have a really great panel for this. Norm Fruchter, the man in black, is senior scholar at the Annenberg Institute for School Reform at Brown University and a mayoral appointee to the Panel for Educational Policy, which is an advisory board to the Department of Ed. He founded and directed the Institute for Education and Social Policy at NYU. He served as the Education Program Officer at the Aaron Diamond Foundation, and he's directed an alternative high school for dropouts in Newark, and has an alternative bachelor's degree program for community activists and public sector workers in Jersey City. He served 10 years on his local Brooklyn school board, and he's published extensively on school inequity. He's also published two novels and co-directed several award-winning documentaries. No sweat. He was one of the founders of the Campaign for Fiscal Equity, which was the lawsuit over school funding in New York State. Next to him is Craig Gurian, Executive Director of the Anti-Discrimination Center. He's devoted his professional career fighting for an open and inclusive society. He conducted the first jury trial in the country of a sexual harassment and education case arising under Title IX, and he's been active in defending the rights of people with disabilities. He's perhaps best known for developing and prosecuting the groundbreaking False Claim Act litigation against Westchester County. The county was found to have fraudulently claimed that it was affirmatively furthering fair housing, an action that led to the entry of a landmark housing desegregation consent decree. He's a published author and currently an adjunct professor at Columbia University. And next to Norm is Clara Hempel, senior editor of the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School and founder of InsideSchools.org, the website. She leads the center's policy work on economic segregation of the city's schools, examining why there are schools with high concentrations of poverty, even in mixed income neighborhoods. The New York Times called her three books the most definitive guides to the city's schools. New York Magazine called her one of the 200 most influential New Yorkers for her work empowering parents. As a reporter and editorial writer for New York Newsday, she shared the Pulitzer Prize for local reporting. She was a foreign correspondent for the AP and a producer for CBS News based in Rome. She lives in Manhattan with her husband, Robert Snyder, two children who attended public school. And next to her and next to me is Nicole Hannah-Jones, a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine covering racial inequality. Prior to joining the Times, she spent the last few years at the nonprofit investigative reporting organization ProPublica, where she investigated the way segregation in housing and schools is created and maintained through official actions. Her 2014 investigation into school resegregation won several national awards, including two online news association awards, the Sigma Delta Chi Award for Public Service, the Fred Heckinger Grand Prize for Distinguished Education Reporting, and she was a National Magazine Award finalist. Hannah Jones has also been named the 2015 Journalist of the Year by the National Association for Black Journalists. So. A lot of very distinguished people here who know what they're talking about. And I just want to preface this by saying there was this enormously noteworthy study that came out last year in 2014 by UCLA on segregation in the schools, finding New York State had some of the most segregated schools in the country. And what this study found was that around the state, typically half the kids in the public schools are low income. But if you break it down by race, a typical white kid attended a school of less than 30% classmates who are low income. So white kids weren't exposed to too many low-income kids, only about 30% on average. By contrast, the typical black or Latino kid in New York State attends a school where close to 70% of the classmates are low-income. And that's just New York State. It's even more concentrated in some places, including New York City. There's 32 community school districts in New York City for the elementary and middle schools, 19, more than half of those, are heavily minority in their concentration. That means they had less than 10% of their students are white in 2010. 
This included all the districts in the Bronx, two thirds of them in Brooklyn, half the districts in Manhattan, and two fifths of the districts in Queens. And even Staten Island, where we think it's the whitest borough, is also heavily segregated. There's a lot of internal variation. Some schools have greater than 80% white kids. There's other schools where less than 40% of the kids are white. So this is a very segregated school district, school system, when you look at who's going to the kids by race and by class. So we want to get to the bottom of this. And it's clear from the research over the years that segregation is bad for kids. It's not good for them. Schools that are segregated have fewer high quality teacher, teachers. The concentrations of poverty are predictors of student achievement. Very high poverty schools have low achievement scores. That's just how it is. We see the achievement gaps. We talk about this as journalists. We talk about it as educators, the achievement gap between black and Hispanic children and white and Asian children. Why is it so big? The studies show that there's benefits of integration in the, out, in the academic outcomes when kids are not so segregated. So looking back on the history of it, I want to ask each of you, what do you see as the biggest obstacles to integration? Why are the schools still so segregated so many decades after Brown versus the Board of Education? Um, Let's start at the end of the table. Craig Gurian, I know you believe housing is a big factor. Yeah, th this, uh, this is, this is an, an easy one. And um, if you can put up one slide tonight, so if we can put okay, that. OK, we see the five if we, boroughs. If, if, we, if we could put that up. Um, even though you can't go um, 10 minutes in New York City without hearing how diverse the city is. It's actually, residentially, an extraordinarily segregated place and where you have segregated housing, you have segregated schools. End of story. Just to explain the slide for a moment, these are um, block groups in the city as of 2010. And anywhere you see blue, that's uh, less than 5% African American. Um, and where you see a shade of red, that's anywhere at least 50%. And the, and the brightest, uh, most vibrant red, that's greater than 80% African American. But Latino is not part of that? The, well, let, Latino segregation is also very intense in New York City, but this is showing it for African Americans, and uh, just to continue for a moment on, uh, in terms of African Americans, of the 30 largest cities in the United States, so progressive New York, what, like we, like we, like we are like so far ahead of everybody else. Well, of the 30 largest cities in the United States, we're the second most segregated for African Americans. But isn't it getting better over time? Well, it, it is. Uh, it is better than it was in 1968 when the Fair Housing Act was passed. But if you go from 1980 to 2010 for those 30 largest cities, and you look at the rate of decline in segregation, how much has it declined? New York City of those 30 cities has had the least decline of any big city in the country. And as I say, the school patterns follow this. This isn't to say that other mechanisms and strategies that are going to be discussed here tonight can't do anything. In my own view, if residential segregation continues to be ignored or justified, it's really playing around the edges. Last point on this. Um, many people don't like to think about history very much at all, and particularly in this context. These neighborhood patterns did not fall from the sky. They were all, all of them, the pattern of intentional conduct from every single player in the housing market. I mean every single type of player in the housing market, including very notably New York City itself. And there are policy, New York City policies in the past that created and perpetuated segregation and there are 
New York City policies today, including its outsider restriction policy in housing lotteries that continue to perpetuate that segregation. If we're not going to deal with that, we're going to be back, or some of you will be back in 10 or 20 years, and we'll be be bemoaning the same thing. I I could just neatly go down the table, because you're all writing, but let's mix it up, because Nicole Hannah-Jones is writing very furiously, so I want to ask you, while it's fresh in your mind, do you agree with that, or do you see another cause? So, yeah, I I agree partially, and and I think it's not as simple. Um, So, just very quickly, there's... If you look at the civil rights legislation that was passed in the 60s, um, the, the one that has been the, the, the failure, the one where we've made the least progress is housing. So Greg is absolutely right in that. Why have we made the least progress in housing? Because housing is most intimate. If I don't want to go to a restaurant with people who have a different color, I don't have to. But I can't choose who lives next to me. So I think that housing we've made the least progress on, and therefore schools, which tend to be um, connected to neighborhoods we've also made very little progress on. But I think what I would add to that is um, the biggest thing I think is the inequality that very progressive people are willing to accept. People who think that they believe in um, equity, but when it comes down to the personal decisions they make and whether they support equity in practice, we can look at New York, you can look at any progressive city in this country, and those are the cities that are the most residentially segregated and where the schools are the most segregated. Chicago, Newark, Philadelphia, Boston, New York, I can go down the line. So what I would say is, um, in New York, Housing integration will only get you so far because there's been a large-scale abandonment of public schools by white people, period. You don't have enough white kids left in New York City public schools to do large-scale integration. Um, So that's a big part of it is across the country you've seen in communities where there was a large migration of black Americans into the north, you saw a large wide-scale abandonment of public schools by uh, white residents. And if you can't deal with that, then you're not going to be able to integrate a district like New York City. Um, And also the highly fractured nature of school districts in the north. So in the south, desegregation worked because there was one school district for an entire county. Your options were you either paid for private school or you dealt with integration. In, the, in New York, in the north, all you had to do was move five miles down the road to a white enclave and you didn't have to pay public school tuition and you could avoid integration. So I think that highly fractured nature of school districts in the north also makes integration um, very difficult unless you can regionalize and integrate with suburbs. Clara? Um, I want to shift the conversation slightly from racial segregation to economic segregation. Um, There are a certain number of uh, black parents who say, why do we need white kids to make our schools good? And the truth is that there are many all-black schools which are very good, but there are not very many schools with intense uh, poverty which are very good. So the issue is intense levels of poverty with uh, the attendant problems that come with it and not racial segregation per se. A school with... What, when you say enhanced, a high concentration of poverty, meaning above 50 percent, above what we, 40 percent? We at the Center for New York City Affairs um, have written a report called The Better Measure of Poverty. We think that free lunch rates are actually a very crude measure. You can qualify for free lunch if you're a postal worker or a nurse or a subway uh, worker, and you, you, know, you get your kids to school on time and make them do their homework. What we have um, put into our measure of poverty is other risk factors like homelessness or uh, child abuse or neglect cases or uh, long-term unemployment. These are things which we consider high levels of poverty rather than, than free lunch rate. It's true that the whites have abandoned many of the schools, but it's also true that middle-class blacks have abandoned, uh, well, they never trusted the public schools in New York City for good reason. But that um, there, and in terms of the um, the segregation, yeah, I mean that line along Flatbush Avenue is pretty sharp. But there are a lot of purple sections of the city as well. That is, cities with um, sections with uh, mixed incomes. And you know what? Those are segregated as well. So that on the Upper West Side, you have schools that have are next to brownstones have very um, have mixed have some very rich people right next to some very poor people, but those schools still have almost all black and Hispanic kids and almost all the kids are uh, qualified for free lunch. 
So if you say the problem is, I know you're not saying this, Craig, but if you in the 50s, the Board of Ed said we can't integrate the schools because the neighborhoods are segregated. That's been an excuse for a long time. Our research so far has suggested that there are about 100 public elementary schools where the population is significantly poorer than the surrounding neighborhood. Those are schools that could be um, uh, integrated without busing if, if the neighborhood parents chose to send their kids to them. Right, so cases like a school on the Upper West Side, for example, that still has a high concentration of poverty even though it's surrounded by wealthy people, you're saying that you, you could convince the wealthier people to send their kids there? In some cases it's, um, can, well, in some cases it's getting strong leadership and good teaching which will convince uh -huh. the wealthier people to come. In some cases there are also gerrymandered districts so that there be a housing project on the west side and there'll be a, a circle around it for a school and all the poor kids go to that school and then two blocks away the rich kids go to that school. Right. Well, I do want us to talk about potential solutions and zoning will be on that list, but Norman Fruchter, what do you say is the biggest uh, cause of the segregation patterns? I mean, I, I tend to agree that uh, housing segregation, residential segregation is critical and that we've created that segregation and then accepted it. With the housing patterns? Yep, but um, the federal government had a huge role to play in this. It's not just New York City law, it's federal government law, the Federal Housing Administration, uh, redlined and segregated districts for a long time, the way mortgages were, were given, the, the role of the Veterans Administration and who got mortgages and who didn't. For me, what stands out is the role of the Supreme Court uh, in a series of decisions that limited what you could do with integration. It's, it's less telling in New York City because we're such a huge metropolis with a, and the suburban boundaries don't play that much, but the decision in a Michigan district, I can't remember which, which it was that said, Millican. yeah, Milliken, that said you cannot um, bus or transfer students across district boundaries from cities to suburbs was a huge restriction on what one might have been able to do with uh, moves towards integration. Right now, the school system is, is very segregated, but less segregated than the city. It's about 40% Latino, 30% black, 15% white, and 15% Asian. Right. The, the city's population is different from that. But if you look at the dissimilarity index in both cases, and I'll talk about that later, the, the city as a res residential entity is more segregated than the school system. Um, so kids are mingling among different races more when they're in school than you say adults are in their neighborhoods? No, because, I mean, mingling, adults have much more freedom of movement than they, okay. they can <laughs> mingle in all sorts of ways. The, as you go, Elementary schools are very segregated in New York. They're the most segregated of the three levels because they represent micro neighborhoods. Middle schools draw from wider areas and there's more choice, so they're less segregated. When I say less segregated, they're still very segregated, but less than elementary schools. And high schools are the least segregated. Though again, uh, to get to 40, 30, 15, 15 in every high school in the city, more than half the kids in the high schools would have to move in order to make that happen. So there's, there's still a huge amount of segregation, right? But it gets um, small but significantly better as you move up to school levels because of choice, because of a wider area that the schools draw from. Have there been policies in, uh, you've, you've talked about some of the older policies from the federal government, but in recent years locally, the Bloomberg administration, the beginning of mayoral control, have there been local policies that have aggravated or alleviated any of these problems? Clara, I know you believe the change in open enrollment in the districts aggravated things. Well, New York City has never really had, has never really tried integration. Um, right. We got community control instead. Um, uh, and districts. there was a time when uh, in the 70s, white flight to the suburbs made it almost a moot point. At a certain point, there were so few white people left in the city that you couldn't have racial integration. Um, but there was something called open enrollment, 
uh, which allowed voluntary transfers of students from one school to another if there was space. So that there were a certain number of uh, black families from Southeast Queens who went to Bayside, District 26. There were, um, in, in Staten Island, there were some people who, who moved. So it was mostly black families going to schools that were perceived as better in mostly white neighborhoods. And did that change? That changed under the Bloomberg administration. He uh, prohibited, it was never publicly announced, but he just prohibited those kinds of inter-district uh, transfers. Um, so that in um, District 26 in Northeast Queens, those, even though the principals wanted to take fill their seats with black kids from District 29, from Southeast Queens, they weren't allowed to. What well, was Harlem, the goal to try to encourage more local people to use their schools? I think what that was the, the, I mean, it was never announced, so right. we don't know, but that was the, and then parents from Harlem would send their kids to the schools on Upper West Side. Um, I think the idea was to, um, conspiracy theorists said it was to get the uh, those parents to send their kids to the charter schools. It was a way of bolstering charter schools. I don't have any evidence of that. Right. And we also know that with the rise of charter schools, the UCLA study found that they are so hyper-segregated because they opened in low-income communities of color that the study called them apartheid schools. These are schools where a minuscule number of kids are white and they're mostly black and Latino, or mostly black or mostly Latino in many of these neighborhoods because they, their enrollment policies favored the local That's community. That's also looking at, at race. If you look at social class, they actually have a somewhat more uh, prosperous uh, parent body than the, the district schools that surround them. I actually wanted, that's a good uh, segue. I wanted to push back a little bit on that notion that the segregation is not a racial segregation, that it's just economic segregation, because we know that those two things are interlinked. Um, there are lots of poor white children in this country, but outside of places in the rural South, they are not going to schools that are concentrated poverty. Absolutely. This is a racialized poverty, and it's racialized in the neighborhoods, and it's racialized in the schools. So for instance, what the census shows is that middle income to affluent black Americans are more likely to live in a poor neighborhood than poor white Americans. So what that means is poor white Americans get access to middle class schools. Wealthy or not wealthy, but more affluent and middle class black Americans do not. And so what we're seeing when you have the numbers that you read, which is that the black population in New York is not 70% poor, but they are going to schools that are 70% poor. That tells you that it is a combination. I think sometimes we are more comfortable with class-based because we feel we can transcend our class and you can't transcend your race, but these two are absolutely linked. There are poor white children in New York City public schools too. They are not going to high poverty schools. Norm? I, uh, Nicole just made me remember something I forgot. <laughs> because New York is such a wealthy city, uh, it's such a magnet for wealth across the country, there's a huge buyout from the public school system by people who can afford to buy out. We've, there are different studies, but it's possible that more than 30% of the age eligible kids are not in the public school system. If they were in the public school system, the, uh, the racial, ethnic, and poverty percentages Absolutely. would be very different. So I, I'd like us to talk about solutions. And one thing I just want to start with is that there have been some schools you might have heard about here in this neighborhood in Brooklyn and uh, where there's been a zoning change that was proposed in parts of Fort Greene, um, Upper Manhattan, school principals have said they wanted to integrate their neighbor, their schools a little bit better. These are schools in neighborhoods that are gentrifying. There's more wealthy people moving in and they wanna make sure that their kids are not displaced. So they've talked about having something called controlled choice where they can set aside a certain percentage of seats for kids from their community. So there was a new school in Brooklyn, PS 133, that set aside 35% of its seats for English language learners in Park Slope. And so principals are coming up with suggestions like these and they propose them to the mayor and Chalkbeat New York, the website, did a story recently saying that they haven't heard anything back from the mayor or the chancellor. This was a year ago that they came up with some ideas. So WMYC's Brian Lair asked the chancellor and somebody else asked the mayor recently about this on the first day of school. Um, here's the mayor responding to the question of what can we do about segregation? Will? 
Look, um, I believe we have a, a long history that we're trying to overcome in this city and in this country of division. And I think we always do better uh, when we find greater unity and greater coming together. So uh, I think right now, as Gail pointed out, the pre-K program is starting to do some of that on its own. The after-school programs are. All of the school choice programs at the middle school and high school levels. But as the Chancellor said earlier, we are looking for other ways we can do things. Um, we want to be creative. We want to see if there's other ways we can further this work, because it really is historic and necessary work. But we also don't have you know, the perfect solution yet. So we, we're going to keep working on that. In other words, no solution. He said affordable housing will help with diversity in schools, though, and he has a, an ambitious affordable housing program. So then, uh, he, this is Carmen Farina, the school's chancellor on Brian Lehrer's show, when asked a couple of days, or a day earlier, about those principles and what they proposed. I think we're looking at every plan individually. We need to make sure that the diversity plans don't disenfranchise other students. So it's, you know, and diversity is not just about ethnicity, it's also about socioeconomic. Uh, it's also about language, um, you know, in terms of which students speak which language and are you prepared to do that. And diversity is also about special needs kids. You know, are schools taking on their special, as many special needs kids as they should. So we're looking so at the So these individual. are building by building, principle by principle right. diversity there plans? Are well, in many cases, they put it through for what we call the pros uh, schools. They put plans in place, and we've already accepted some of those. But some schools have asked for waivers to accept students from certain other neighborhoods or certain ethnicities. So I think we're looking at how do we make it equitable, because one of the things we're looking at is in terms of all our general enrollment policies. We're looking at them as a collective whole as well as individually, but it's definitely a concern of the mayors and mine, and it's one of the reasons also that we're partnering schools with each other that are totally different, so that there's other ways of sharing this diversity. Look. I don't know if you heard a answer there? No. <laughs> okay. So one, one concern that's been raised is that there are legal problems with solutions. So there was a 2007 U.S. Supreme Court ruling when Seattle and I believe St. Louis, no, it was Louisville. Louisville, wanted to try desegregation programs and the court stopped them. And New York City has been citing that as a reason why we can't do you know, racial set-asides, for example. Do, do you, as panel members here, agree with New York City's interpretation of the law? Is there a federal or a constitutional problem in trying desegregation programs here? So the short answer is no. Um, and actually the Obama administration, which has done very, very, very little on integration overall, has uh, released guidance about that Supreme Court case. In fact, telling districts that they can take um, race into account. What, th what that ruling said was that basically um, school districts that were allotting a certain number of seats for children of a certain race, that that was unconstitutional. But in, a, in the plurality decision, Justice Kennedy said that districts could take race into account by doing different things. You could um, zone according to neighborhoods. So you could zone two very segregated neighborhoods into the same school. Um, you could take into account socioeconomics. And in some ways, you could actually take into what Anthony um, Kennedy said was that you could actually take race into account if you had tried other things to integrate your schools and they didn't work. And so the Obama administration actually made it clear because a lot of school districts um, kind of saw that ruling as a godsend not to have to try anymore and to be able to say, well, the Supreme Court has ruled on this. And so they made it clear that actually districts can still do a lot of things. And controlled choice would certainly be one of those things because one, controlled choice is typically not even um, using race as the proxy. It's using socioeconomic status or it's using um, ELL. And the Supreme Court is certainly, sorry has not ruled on either of those things because neither of those are protected classes. Um, so I think that what you're hearing is, is an unwillingness to deal with the issue, which I actually find to be very interesting because I've, I've been at these meetings where groups of white parents have come up to the chancellor and said, we want to implement diversity measures in our school. And they've basically been shut down. And, and I'm actually not really sure why that is. Norman Fructor, you have a proposal to the Panel on Educational Policy later this month about this very, very issue, don't you? To allow for these types of, of controlled choice desegregation programs. 
No, we have we haven't. I have I have a proposal to strike the footnote in uh, Chancellor's regulation that says that you cannot use race except by court order. Which is there, you know, citing that Supreme Court ruling as the rationale for right. not doing it. That was put in in 2008. And well, would that then say if you get rid of that? That, is that telling them go ahead and do more of these programs like the principals have asked? I, I think for myself that, and there's going to be a discussion at the education, uh, the, prior, the I always call at it the, the educational PMA, priorities. Which problem. is, for all of you, it's very conveniently being held on Staten Island that night. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there's going to be, a, I, I, I think, a beginning discussion about race and diversity in New York City school system and clearly what the school system does about that. Um, the federal government, after the 2007 Supreme Court decision, I can't remember how long after, told school districts directly that they could not use race as a, as a category, but also suggested proxies. Uh, proxies uh, meaning neighborhoods uh, or? Socioeconomic status. Right, okay. Right? English uh, language so learners. So I think that if you think about control choice, not as... Um, uh, and I'm jumping the gun because you're going to okay. get... You want, you want me to hold that or...? Uh, no. Are you going to make some news? <laughs> so, yeah. Go for it. All right. Ben Max is here. There are about 18% of the school system who are kids with disabilities, special ed kids. About 13% um, who are ELL kids. And a category that... Uh, I'm particularly interested in over-the-counter students at the high school level. The ones those, who show up right before registration. Yeah, those you know, who right. have missed the choice process and who come in afterwards. Um, I think if you set, at the, I'm only talking about high schools because I can't figure out how you would do this below the high school level. But at the high school level, if you had set-asides for those three categories, and the percentages are arguable and will be argued about, uh, and every school had to accept X percentages of special ed students, Y percentages of ELL students, and Z percentages of OTC, over-the-counter students. And many high schools, especially the ones at the upper end of the hierarchy, don't accept those percentages. If you did that, you would substantially contribute to integrating the school system. You would not get beyond the 40, 30, 15, 15, because that's impossible but you would change the configuration of many schools, and my hunch is that those categories of kids would get a better education than they're getting now, because the schools, if you know what the graduation rates are for all three categories, they're not good. And I think this would both contribute to raising the educational levels and also um, reducing segregation, at least across the high school system. Clara, do you think controlled choice would help? I don't know what you, if you want to comment on Norman's. No, I mean, I, I, but I, I want to talk a little bit about the, uh, about the elementary schools. I mean, the, the, the Department of Ed does set aside a certain number of seats now, you know, for special ed um, and, and over-the-counter kids. But it's not, it's, it's, not systemic. it's um, yeah, it's not effective right now. I agree. Um, but in the, in the elementary schools, um, control choice is um, on the Lower East Side. It's a, you know, it's a very small district one, mm -hmm. um, and you can walk very easily to all of the schools. And the idea was that if you had some, bef uh, before the Bloomberg administration, those schools had a sort of informal set-asides to try to balance out the proportion of, of different races. And um, there were about, it's largely Latino, the, the neighborhood, and there's about five schools that white people want to send their kids to, and they're all the progressive schools. Um, and when Bloomberg said you can't use race anymore, those schools became increasingly white. And the parents wanted the uh, parents at those schools thought it would be a fair deal to um, uh, limit the number of whites so that black and Latino kids would have a chance at these progressive schools. Um, I'm not against controlled choice, but That's it doesn't um, increase the number of schools that are considered desirable. Right. So they've had controlled choice in Cambridge, Massachusetts for many, many, many years, 
and there's still three or four schools that the white parents want to send their kids to, and the other schools no, you know, never close. They stay in low-level uh, performance. So um, if you see, see controlled choice as a more equitable way to distribute a scarce resource of good seats in a public school, I suppose it's OK. But it doesn't do anything to increase the number of seats. I want to ask Craig and um, Nicole to weigh in on zoning, because that's another solution, is to say, especially if a school is overcrowded, you can get in there and say, well, let's change the boundaries for which kids are going to go to this school. And I know here in this neighborhood, PS8 is overcrowded. PS 307 in Vinegar Hill is not, but has a very different composition than the wealthier kids at PS 8. And, you know, are those the types of solutions that the city can use whenever a school is crowded to, like, make that a good excuse to change the boundaries? What do each of you think of that? Craig, we haven't heard from you in a while. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah uh, if, if I may just go back to the mayor's comment for a, sure. mo for yeah. a, a moment, because it, it's certainly easy to observe that it wasn't let's say, fully responsive uh, to the question. I tried. <laughs> uh, but, but I mean, in fact, um, an, a, a serious affordable housing policy, and whether or not you agree with the particulars or not, uh, the administration has, I think, a serious affordable housing policy, can have a real impact in terms of desegregating uh, the school system because of desegregating housing and making more places more attractive, but not if you avoid putting affordable housing in neighborhoods of opportunity and not if you have selection procedures for the housing that bakes in the, uh, the existing patterns. Um, in terms of zoning, like community districts, there has been um, gerrymandering of school districts as well, you know, but I, I do think that it's, it's a little uh, too easy, and I'm saying this as somebody who's like only been a civil rights advocate my entire professional life, it, it, you know, Yes, sometimes people, uh, some people use race as a proxy to determine that they don't like a school or, or, some, or something else. But sometimes it is the concentrations of poverty, and I agree with Nicole 100% that those are racialized patterns that skews the decision. I mean, it's extraordinary. I mean, and you, you could all call me Johnny OneNote on the residential end, but it skews every single thing that goes on in this city, whether it's schools or exposure to toxins or employment opportunities, access to medical care, and you know, parents um, parents make decisions for their children, and that's not surprising. May I just add one thing very, very quickly? One of the really toxic things and paralyzing things to me as a lifelong New Yorker is, again, for a very progressive place, there's a tremendous amount of self-censorship that goes on. And I think that it would be very helpful to, say, in the educational uh, arena, you know, ask parents more directly what you want. And I think that the civil rights principle would tell you that uh, regardless of race or ethnicity, they'd want some of very similar things. They wouldn't be looking uh, for race matching of their teachers. Um, they'd want teachers who um, both knew their subject matter and were good in the classroom. They'd want to have schools where they know they could go to work and not worry all day long about whether they were going to get a phone call. And we did something that I think is pretty interesting and uh, uh, on the housing side because to hear all the people who are invested in the status quo, and there's a lot of people, both elected and organizationally, who are invested one way or another in the segregated status quo, there's a lot of talk out there that people like things, including African Americans and Latinos, like things the way they are now. And so we did a very extensive field study. It, there are neighborhoods now. Uh, you get it at antibiaslaw.com slash mobility. And it asked people, and we made it about willingness to move 
to a neighborhood to get affordable housing. And we made it very, very difficult on ourselves. We didn't say, you know, just like move to the neighborhood next door. Um, without any prepping at all, without any housing counseling, we said, would you move to another borough? Would you move to a suburb? The respondents were overwhelmingly African American. The, um, through a wide range of the income spectrum, um, weighted somewhat to lower income than higher income. Um, and it turned out that 69% of our respondents said that they would be willing to move to at least one other borough than they currently lived in. 60% of respondents said they were willing to move to at least one of the suburbs of New York that we identified. People, when you ask them, are a lot less uh, identified with and insistent on the status quo. And I think if more of our discussion took that into account, if to quote the mayor, which I think I'll do in our lawsuit, we always do better when we come together, when there's less of the, it's our neighborhood, not yours, it's our school, not yours, um, that would, you know, that would be a much better state of affairs. Okay, so on that, Nicole, do you see parents in this neighborhood where there's been a rezoning plan saying it's our school, not yours, or, you know, are, are people as flexible as Craig is saying? Is, can zoning be a solution? Well, one, I think Craig is saying that the people he surveyed were largely black, and I think that obviously makes a difference. It makes a difference in the choices and opportunities you have. So I'm actually a public school parent, and my daughter goes to PS307, which is the um, under-enrolled, high-poverty, segregated school that half of the PSA district would go to. And what I can tell you is that, um, no, I don't, I don't know that it will be the answer because what you hear is parents in the zoned half that will now come to PS307 threatening to leave. What they're saying is we won't go. Um, well, whether all of them will do that or not, I don't know. But um, I think the problem is once you have a school with a poverty rate, so the 307 zone is drawn around the Farragut houses. That is the entire zone. So it was set up to be exactly what it is. That is a school that is almost impossible to integrate because any parent who has choice typically, um, I'm a little off, I'm, but <laughs> most parents typically would not choose a school like that. I chose that school because I'm not gonna be the people that I write about. I, I believe that, <laughs> I believe that all children can learn. My dad was born on a sharecropping farm in Mississippi and you can't get poorer than that and didn't make him a stupid man, so. And I've heard good things about the school. <laughs> Staff. Yeah, it's you a great must school. like them. I do like the school. Um, so I think that I think that zoning can. I don't want to say that zoning cannot work. Zoning can work. I think when uh, a district allows a school to become that concentrated with poverty, it is an almost impossible school to integrate. And even when you're looking at controlled choice, controlled choice is an effort not to completely gentrify a school that white parents have come into. It's not integrating a school. It's a school that is reaching a tipping point, and even then, you are now saying, we want to keep a small segment of our population diverse in a school that is now going to be majority white. That is very different than integrating a school like mine. Um, so I don't know, honestly, what the answers are. I, whenever I give talks and when I write my stories, I never end on a hopeful message. The, the, <laughs> the, this, is, this is true. This is true. I mean, the, if you are in a city with one of the most progressive mayors in the country and we are under the Obama administration and they will not talk about school integration and segregation and this is toxic for them, then what really hope does one have that we're going to see any large scale change for the masses? And the difference is integration is a bonus for some. It's nice if I have it. Integration is an imperative for many. And for those people, those are the ones who don't have the voice, and those are the ones who can't say. For the kids in my school, integration is an imperative. That's the only way that they get quality. We have not yet managed to break that link between race, class, and resources. We know that those kids are getting the least qualified teachers, they're getting the least rigorous curriculum, and that has not changed. And the only way, I mean, there's nothing magical about, I mean, white people are great, I love you guys, but there's nothing magical about being in a classroom with white people that makes black kids smart. It's what they suddenly get. 
It's what they get. I, I was a product of busing. I know what I got from being bused from my segregated schools to integrated ones. I was the same kid. I was just as smart both places, but I got a hell of a lot more from going to that integrated school. So I don't know how we fix a problem that even the most progressive of, of us are, are willing to sustain. I don't know what the answer is. Okay. Sorry. I know we want to save time for audience questions, but I just have one more question very quickly I want to ask the four of you because we can't end this on such a downer. <laughs> The UCLA study suggested magnet schools, magnet programs in a school that attract parents and kids for you know, special art, music, science, whatever, that those could be a way of integrating schools. And I'm wondering if you agree, and also are gifted and talented programs that we have in New York City, are those a potential way to integrate the schools because right now, Sadly, the majority of kids who get into the gifted and talented programs are coming from the more affluent parts of the city. There's less than 10 kids each year who get in from District 7 in the, in the South Bronx who get into a citywide gifted and talented program. So what do you guys think of that? Just, you know, if, if each of you, starting with Norman, can just yeah, weigh I, in on G&T and magnet schools. Can that be a, pl a positive way? Yeah, I'll talk to the magnet school thing and the G&T thing, but I want to say, in terms of zoning, which we just left, um, it's only applicable, I think, to the elementary schools. It's clearly not applicable to high schools at all. And there's so much more choice at the middle school level than there used to be, then zoning soon won't be applicable to middle schools at all. And there's a certain amount of choice at the elementary school level. So I think choice works against zoning. And I also have a feeling, which I can't prove by the research we've done so far, I think choice works against, I think choice increases segregation, yeah. especially, it does. particularly at the high school level. Yeah. Now, uh, I think there's a huge difference between magnet programs and G&T programs. Um, I spent a long time in my local school system trying to curb and limit the G&T programs because they were premised on an entry exam at kindergarten age, which I thought was totally ridiculous. And I thought that the, the, the testing mechanisms uh, were um, without any research basis and also could be manipulated incredibly by, by practice. Uh, it's a long story, but uh, gifted and talented programs, I think, as we do them in New York City, are tainted by their admissions requirements. Okay, Craig? No, that's not magnet programs. I, I think, know, there's a difference. Okay. I think magnet programs have worked in the past. I think the research is good. I think they could work. We do few of them. We should do more. Okay, Craig, what do you think? You know, it, by the way, it, it, I mean, one of the great things about being on a panel with Nicole, other than what she says, is it's great. Like, it's one of the few chances I get to sound uh, relatively optimistic. Okay. <laughs> um, so, 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 I mean, and it, that, that's, pretty, that's pretty rare. So I just say very quickly, uh, yes, I'd say yes on both, and I think that there's been a tremendous problem uh, in New York. Uh, uh, I mean, if we were actually all able to be comfortable with the idea of two things going on at the same time. Number one, that unequal results are an automatically invalid. And number two, it's essential to be super vigilant to make sure that racial and ethnic stereotypes aren't warping advantage. That would be a way to move forward and to make more parents comfortable with more schools. Now, to reduce it um, in a way that gets rid of all nuance, more people on the right just are very uncomfortable with the idea of the vigilance to make sure that um, African American or Latino students aren't stereotyped, either out of a G&T program or out of a you know an AP, or out of AP programs. And people on the left, such as it is in New York, are very very uncomfortable with differential results of any. Type. It's part of what I've described earlier in the evening about the self-censorship and kind of rote lock-in that happens in New York. 
if you had both of those going on with more people, you'd have more solutions, you'd wind up having better functioning schools, and I think there'd be a greater universe of schools that were seen by more people, more parents, as places that they want to send their kids to. Clara, magnet schools, solution? Um, oh, I'm an optimist too. Oh, all right, uh, everyone's um, got to weigh in. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think there, um, not only can we integrate the schools, I think there are a large number of schools which have been successfully integrated in the last 10 years or so. PS8, um, 10 years ago, was, um, had a 90% free lunch rate, it had an enrollment of 300 kids, and it was 90% uh, black and Latino. Um, and it's now got 880 kids, and it's um, uh, um, a mix. I mean, it is 60% white, it's majority white, but it still has 40% kids of other colors. Um, all over the city, you know, there's schools in Harlem which are beginning to get integrated, there's schools in Hell's Kitchen, there's schools um, in East Harlem. Um, and we've identified perhaps 100 schools, which, uh, elementary schools, which we think um, can be uh, better integrated. In terms of magnet programs, the magnet programs in New York in the last 10 years or so have not been particularly successful. I think uh, some of them have. Um, some of them, the money has been squandered by putting a lot of money into a school with poor leadership and, and ineffective uh, uh, teaching. So the magnets are, work the best when you have very strong leadership and, and good. So if you pick out the right leaders, I think the magnet schools can be effective. I think dual language programs are also, uh, can be very effective taking advantage of kids who speak another language at home and encouraging English speaking kids to learn the other language. Right, the Chancellor had mentioned that. There's 40 new dual language programs. Finally, Nicole, do you wanna be optimistic or <laughs> pessimistic on the topic I of mean, that would just be magnet our schools? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I've been, I've been uh, writing about school segregation for more than a decade now, and I have seen the inside of so many schools, and what I can say is that there are definitely, I think it's important to have some hope, because if not, then I think everyone can throw up their hands and feel okay about the status quo. But I think what's true is that there are some schools that are integrating, but what is also true is that for masses of kids, they get nothing. They get no magnet, they get no talented and gifted, they get no integration. And so we can feel good about pointing to a school like PS8, which under the zoning would actually could go down to only 25% students of color and 75% white in a district that's 14% white. Um, but for every one of those, there's five, six, seven, eight, nine entirely black and Latino high poverty schools. Um, so I think we have not found the fix that will provide an equal education to most black and Latino kids. And that's why it's very hard for me to be optimistic. Um, I think talented and gifted, I'm actually running numbers on this right now. And if you're looking at talented and gifted, it just, it does not tend to benefit black and Latino kids. You can't really find a district in the country where black and Latino kids are being placed at those at a proportionate level. Um, so I think what it ends up doing is just reserving the best teaching and the best um, education for kids who are already privileged. That's, that's typically what we find. All kids should be getting that level of teaching and instruction. Um, and schools that detract actually do show that the, um, Kids with more privilege still do well, and the kids who have less, less privilege actually come up. Um, there was actually a great uh, principal in Long Island that, that implemented detracking and wrote a book about it, and she was very successful. I think magnets had the potential. I mean, this was kind of the key voluntary desegregation program. I think magnets are being used less and less actually for desegregation. Uh, I think that what often is happening with magnets is the same thing as talented and gifted, is that Privileged kids are getting into the magnet, and a handful of non-privileged kids are getting in. And so I, I just think that there's something very demeaning about being in a school district and seeing programs designed, these beautiful, fabulous programs designed to draw some kids um, who don't look like you while you're kind of uh, destined for schools that don't have anything. So uh, in, in I New feel York, like they can largely, work. In, but. in New York, the magnet schools are zoned schools so that, um, right. so that there are the kids. They do in get there. access, yeah. yes. I mean, 
there aren't a lot of things that are working well. I think magnets can work, and there are places where they can work. But again, it's it's always it's 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 helping a small number of students, and we really need to be looking at what can we do for the masses of students, and not just a small number who somehow can work their way into a privileged system. All right, that was great. Thank you, all of you, and I I don't want this to run too late. We, we said we'd be out of here at 8. I mean, we could go a little over time, but I know a lot of people probably want to watch the GOP debate. <laughs> or maybe not. Um, so let's, let's do some audience questions for, you know, at least the next 20 minutes or so. Um, are we going to pass the mic? Yeah, I'll bring a microphone. Great, thanks. We have, we have a microphone that can rove. So um, you in the front row, I saw your hand first. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, about the talented and gifted schools, there's one like really disgusting thing that I didn't hear mentioned. I happen to know two five-year-old little boys. I just happened, unrelated, I know them both. They're both white, they're both upper middle class, and they both live in Brooklyn. And they just got into some school for the exceptionally gifted, I think it's called Nest or something. And so both their parents, because they're not in Manhattan, they're paying $3,000 a year for them to be bused to Manhattan. And then they're also paying the PTA $1,500. So that's a lot of money. And I, like, I imagine that the, you know, the tests themselves are probably rigged against poor students to begin with. But then even if they, you know, pass so the test. What's, what's your point then? What are you, my what's point your is that it's even making the, the segregation even worse because even if they get in, they can't get there. So you, you're saying even if a child from another borough got in or they, it, a low income they, child got in, they couldn't get there? No, Is, no, these kids, I, I, no, I'm saying that they're paying $3,000 to get to the school. Well, that's the parents' choice. Nest does have buses. There are school no, buses. No, that's what they're paying it for is the buses. They cost $3,000 to get them to the public school. The parents are, but other parents can take the school bus. They're five years, they're, they're five years old. There is no school bus. Oh, I see what you're saying because they're five, right. Okay, well, yeah. Um, do you have a question? First, let me thank the panelists. You were outstanding in your presentation. My name is Dr. Anna Maria Thomas. I'm a 39-year veteran, retired teacher from the New York public school system. I am here really to challenge all to come to the realization that mayoral May oral control must end because I don't see any politician who knows how to equitably give to all children and that's what we need to do. I hear racism. Our federal government has, says, has said racism is illegal. We should be filing suit because that's what's happening in our New York City public schools. The second thing in, is, is that we don't have an achievement gap. What we do have is an access gap. If you give to all of our poor children, we have poor children who have been making it and becoming president. So it's not about poverty. It's about access, giving every school what the rich schools seem to get without even asking for. If we can do that, challenge our politicians to stop withholding funds, which we had to file suit to get to bring down class size, which we have yet to do in New York City, we could do much of what needs to be done for our children. Well, I just want to ask, does anyone agree that things were better before mayoral control? Yes. 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 Sorry. Is that true? Do you, do you agree, Clara? No. You've okay. been writing about the schools for a very long time, so I want to know. Would... No, I think things were worse under mayor, uh, before Worse in terms of segregation? Worse in terms of parental involvement? Worse in terms of teaching? You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated question. Um, I, I, yeah. yeah. Yeah, 
Well, all I would say to that is I've covered school districts who have been led by every type of person, politician, educators, and the problems are the same. That's and, all I can say to and that. And before there was mayoral control, the mayor still found a way of running the independent board of education by mm -hmm. cutting deals with them. So, you know, it, I, I covered it before there was mayoral control. And, you know, there was the time that Rudy Giuliani got bought some votes by promising something to the Staten Island guy and right. suddenly we didn't have the school's chancellor that the board wanted because Giuliani didn't want him. So I, you know, I, I see what you guys are saying and I don't, I don't know that is there a perfect system in mm -hmm. which parents are represented and communities are represented? Has well, anyone seen one that well, they think at well, least the, is the better? The issue, I mean the issue I think is when you talk about, when you talk about access, um, you're talking about a word that is underused, and it's power. And the, the problem with status quo politics in New York, with the it's ours and it's not yours, it's very easy to buy people off with crumbs because there'll be a, there'll be a contract, because there'll be some, because there'll be some jobs. That's not a way to yield citywide influence. It's very good for people who are elected to various things locally or for not-for-profits locally, but for wielding influence, having a map like I showed here, um, it's just been a disaster for decades um, for African Americans um, in this city and other places. So I think doubling down, so I think we disagree on the doubling down on the more community as it currently exists, rigidly defined, is not going to work. Okay, let's move on, because we could probably debate that for a long time. You, right there. <laughs> Hi. Hi, um, I'm also a retired New York City school teacher after 35 years, and, uh, and, a, and, and a former a parent of a former public school child, PSA child. <laughs> but um, my question is, no one seems to be mentioning the elephant in the room. What about charter schools? Is that good or bad for integration in New York City? Well, the study found that they were hyper-segregated. But the study also found that they could be a tool to um, become less segregated if they, because they have more creativity in their rules. They could do what Brooklyn Prospect has done, one charter, which has said that we're not going to allow any one group to be a majority. And so they weight their admissions. Um, so, you know, that is one possibility. Charter schools could have more flexibility potentially in who they admit. Do you, either of you think that charters are a force of good or bad in the, in the desegregation issue? Any of you want to weigh in? Well, I, I'm not going to answer whether they're good or bad. I can say what the data shows nationally is that charter schools tend to be more segregated than traditional public schools. You do have some that are integrated, just like there are some traditional ones. But typically, they tend to be either very heavily white, which are being used by um, parents to avoid public traditional public schools, or they tend to be very heavily black and brown, which are uh, used by black and brown parents to exercise the only choice they have because they can't afford private schools. So you don't tend to see a lot of, of integration happening in them. Um, you right behind. So is there any lesson that can be learned from the um, description of PS8's improvement? Uh, I have no idea to what that can be, how, why that happened, and if that can be replicated in any other schools, so there's an improvement in performance and s segregation statistics. Uh, it sounds like more wealthy people moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> it, is, it wasn't more it was wealthy involved, people yes. moving into the neighborhood. It was it was very effective leadership. It was right. it was it using was the a, school. Yeah, and they and they uh, and it was a combination of uh, effective leadership and a little bit of marketing and good teaching. And I like to say inside schools had a little role, was that um, the middle class parents, most uh, white and black, would uh, try out the pre-kindergarten 
we didn't actually talk about pre-kindergarten, but that's an effective, yeah. that's a potential place for integration right. as well. And there's um, been such an expansion of that, as we all know from this mayor. Do you think that I mean, I think middle help? class parents are more willing to take a chance on with their four-year-olds than they are with their older children. And so that if a school is a high poverty school that they're not um, they try sure out. about, they'll try for, for pre-kindergarten. So that what PS8 did is they, they put in a pre-kindergarten uh, pre class. They had right. a very good, um, um, a principal who was able to navigate all the complicated different things of, of parents of different races. And I know what you say, uh, Nikki, that sometimes the gentrifiers take over and the, the um, uh, parents who were there before are dismissed, you know, or not taken seriously. I think that's a problem, but there are some principles, there are very few of them who are able to kind of navigate all of the differences among the parents and get the parents to work together. So it's leadership is, is okay. primarily the thing. I, I, I just, I'd, I'd love to get more audience questions though. Um, you in the red over there with the glasses? There's a guy in the can't see behind me. Yeah, as a, uh, a retired a principal of an unscreened small high school. <laughs> I love Norm's idea of, uh, of asking all schools to share in the wealth of, of uh, especially over the counters. Um, but um, uh, the problem has always been that there's so many selective um, uh, high schools. And uh, so one of my two questions is how do you get the beacons and the millenniums to take their fair share? Is that really is that really feasible? Um, the second question has to do particularly with elementary schools. In, dist in, in neighborhoods where there's so much gentrification, and I've seen examples like uh, people who were on my staff, for instance, who got uh, harassed by their lawn landlords and pushed out. And I'm wondering if, you know, so, the, so it's not a success, it's, 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 it's great to have an integrated school. It's not a success if, if poor kids are getting mm -hmm. displaced. So, the, so my question is, is anybody talking about um, zoning that kind of grandfather's kids in? That if their families once lived in the neighborhood, they have, as a matter of right, uh, the option of going, um, going to the school that they would have been going to had they not been pushed out by gentrification. Does anyone know the, the answer to that? The, I think there's sibling priority, right? The best, here's, here's, the, here's the best way to fight displacement. Fight displacement. <laughs> Do not bake in segregated patterns, whether they're patterns segregated white or segregated black from the past. I mean, if this hadn't happened, you know, if we didn't have this long history, the patterns would look very different today. Why do we want to mimic something that has grown, um, festered um, from a segregated past. The problem of displacement is a very, ser it's a very serious th problem in the way you describe and in other ways. For a very long time, uh, certainly two mayors worth of 20 years, there wasn't very much of anything uh, serious being done about that. And um, I think that's begun to change, there's still more to be done, but that should be the focus that people should uh, concentrate on, okay. stopping involuntary displacement. Norm Fractor has something quick to add before I, we go to another audience gonna, member. I was just going to talk to Janice's point about what are we going to do with all the schools that would resist any kind of uh, uh, controlled choice in which they had to take a certain percentage of categories of kids. Um, you're talking about the selective high schools. Sorry? The That's selective high school. Only, school. only talking about high schools, okay. right? Any administration that set out to do that as a question of policy would face a huge firestorm across the city. I think that it would be interesting to have that fight, yeah. right? <laughs> However it came out, if I was any mayor, not just this mayor, who I think is a, a, a pretty incredible mayor, but if I was any mayor, I don't know whether I would choose to have that fight. Right. You would have to pass a program which for schools that can take the cream of the crop of students to take a certain percentage of special ed kids, 
a certain percentage of ELL kids and a certain percentage of over-the-counter kids. And by the way, most of those kids, huge percentage, are going to be black and Latino. That's how you get increased integration across, up to a point across the whole system. I think to do that, if that were to happen, it would change the school system substantially. But the fight against it, all right, from advantaged parents across the city would be incredible. It would also be a difficult fight to wage for them, and it would also be a difficult fight to wage for the administration. And, you know, it, it, it might get any mayor unelected quite, quite handily. So you, how, what calculus does anyone use who's in elected office to try to figure out it's worth it? I'll so try Nicole that. Nicole has pointed out that there's a man back there who I couldn't see behind the pole who's been Sorry? raising his hand for a long time. I'd like to call on you, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm Jim DeVore. I'm the retired president ah, of uh, Community okay. Education Jim Council for DeVore. District 15. And uh, I think there's been a fair amount of revisionism that's been going on here. Uh, for example, with all due respect, Norm, the right now the most segregated schools in New York are high schools for whites in New York. I mean, that's Bloomberg, one of Bloomberg's great legacies has been that white kids now overwhelmingly go to white schools, it, public schools in New York. It's an IBO numbers that I'm looking at. Um, I would also say, for example... Can you say that there's been an increase yes. in the number of schools that are more than 50% white? Yes. Okay. In other words, under, under, under Bloomberg and certain aspects of school, I mean, whites tend to go to segregated schools more than any other group in New York. Uh, and that's just an astonishing thing, but it's true. Um, at least at the high school level, not at the elementary school level. I agree with you on that. Also, with all due respect, and you, Beth, you should know better about PS 133 since I wrote a piece in school book about it. It's not, this is not, these impetus for these programs are not coming from principals, by and large. Principals very often are very happy to say, I love to choose my students. I mean, that's a normal thing. So I'll have right. X ethnicity. Your, your program came from the community. The ones right. that I'm and referring to now one, are coming from the principals. And the so. District 1 programs mm -hmm. were coming out of the District 1 leadership. Right. Uh, not coming from the principals. I don't know if you can identify a principal. I don't know of any principals. Well, there were some principals who submitted plans to the DOE. And I understand that back. that's correct, but I'm just saying yeah. that right now, the, 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 despite everybody's assumptions, is that community leadership coming from mm -hmm. things like community education councils right. have been the strongest proponents for integration among any of the constituencies in New York. Uh, I'm surprised you, no one's mentioned there was a, something that came out today from the Century Foundation on uh, their idea of inter-district charter schools. Now, I saw that. I saw yeah, that. And it, and they were no, proposing that charters could be more flexible in who Well, they I think it's less significant that the charters are the point than the idea that there are certain criteria. Demand that permit weighted lotteries, to permit to have, but to be committed to diversity, to eliminate tracking within those schools, and to make sure that kids get transportation to those schools which, by the way, Brooklyn kids don't get to nest. They do have to pay for it because in the infinite wisdom of New York is that, is that because it's interborough, they can't send their kids to nest with, unless you pay bus fare. I know I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, 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 I'm validating your point. Okay. Okay, but I'm just curious. Does anybody has, has, do you have any thoughts on the, uh, on this, on the century uh, found the Century Foundation paper that came out today. I'm aware that's kind of a little Are bit... any of you aware of it? Have you read it? No. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Jim. And thank you for stressing the importance of the role of the communities in pressing for these policies. Um, let's just take a couple have more. one question over Somebody here. Somebody on that side. Here in the Brooklyn Historical Society, spot. I'd just like to ask the panelists to push our notion of history back past the current mayor and his predecessor. Brooklyn had a vigorous civil rights movement read by radicals in the 50s and 60s. Bayard Rustin, Milton Galamis, and Rosalie Stutz, Helen Lurie. All these people discussed very radical solutions to the problems of segregation and the goal of school integration. They were met by fierce opponents. There was also then after that the successor strategy of community control that we've touched on. 
Everybody knows the problem is old. Everybody knows the causes of the problems are old. Are there any aspects of the history of struggles for school integration in New York City over 50 plus years that give you ideas to build on strategies to try beyond the kind of shuffling that we're talking about tonight? Because I do know from researching the history of the civil rights movement in Brooklyn in the 50s, the solutions proposed were far more robust than anything we've talked about with transfers and zones and things like that. They were far more vigorous with regard to construction of schools, debates over the role of education in a democratic society, and how schools fit into larger patterns of exclusion and inclusion. So, so your question is whether there's any... Is there a bigger lesson from history to draw from a history right. that goes back past Positive the last 15 Positive examples years? that have worked that any of you have seen that should be tried again? Well, um, it, 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 it really... It really it really is the case that if you take a look in uh, Nexus, the online news database, you will find, a th if you find a thousand articles on segregation in education, um, nine, 995 of them will ignore housing and uh, like three others will be written by Gary Orfield. So, I mean, <laughs> you know, I, I I, I, sorry, I let, Nicole, I left you a little room there. So uh, the, re, the reality is it has been a, it's, it's kind of like, it's sort of like a war on drugs thing. Let, let's, keep on, let's keep on doing the same thing even though we haven't had success for 60, 80 years. You can't, the, the most radical thing to do is in fact to uh, look at where the segregation comes from and that, is housing, so, and it so hasn't been there, you're, you're in disagreement that there have not been any fabulous programs that we're ignoring. I, 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 think that the, I think that there have been attempts to push back, for example, on gerrymandering of school districts. Okay. For example, I mean, that, like, that's, that's an unfortunate thing that happened in parallel. Um, there are... Is that something people should be doing now? Should people be trying to undo so-called gerrymandered school districts? Is that a solution? I, I mean, I think, I, th I think that that's one piece of it. I do have to say that part of what happens uh, and what's going to happen, you asked about pre-K and, you know, the willingness. Part of that has to do with the message that is given. Let's just talk about for a moment, the message that is sent to, I don't know if the phrase being used tonight is parents of advantage or advantaged children or, so, you know, if the, advant if the message is, listen, whether it's a gifted and talented program or tracking or anything else, we are going to be very serious about making sure that racial and ethnic stereotyping doesn't come into it or unconscious bias. I think that a lot of parents of advantage in New York can live with that. If the message is you want something for your kid, um, a gifted and talented program, you're bad, you're not going to get people to go into the school system and you're not going to get people to stay in the school system. Uh, people who are trying to do for their children, I think, can't be seen as the enemy. Okay. Right there, you in the blue shirt. I know you were raising your hand for a while. Thank you. I, I don't want to stand up. I'm handicapped, so I hope that you all can hear me. For the last 26 years, I've lived one block away. I'm also a PS8 parent. I'm also a... St. Anne's parent, and I'm also a Lower East Side, Title I, homeboy high parent. So I will say that uh, I have a broad view on this. And before I go on to tell you a real, real short story, let me also say my name is Benita Rivera. I am the director of the Mother's Agenda in New York, which is a human rights-based education group. And the many, that's our acronym, is led by black women, women of color, although we are an interracial group. When it comes to talking about what parents of color want, uh, we don't talk about segregation. 
We don't talk about integration. This is an issue that seems to be white folks are more concerned about. We are not in 1960, we're not 1970, we're not back in the 50s where this was a problem like with the Skip With case where in 19, what, 58 or 59, black parents in Harlem sued because they wanted their children to go to a better school, probably downtown around 96th Street. We've been fighting this for a long time, and I think that parents of color have thrown up their hands. Segregation is not our conversation. This is your conversation. What we're concerned about is equitable resources. We are concerned about seeing parents, um, seeing parents respected when they come to school, and we are concerned about seeing black and Latino, the disappearance of black and Latino educators. Ms. Hemphill, I will disagree with you strongly on two points. One, about PS8 and the, uh, the change in the demographic, because my son was at PS8 when they tried to put him on the bus, those cheese buses going back to Farragut. We don't live in Farragut projects. We live right there in the Mr. Lama houses. This community right here had plenty of black and Latino kids who were at PS8 20 years ago. And in fact, what would happen is the white kids would stay until second, maybe third grade. After that, they went to private school. They got pulled out. When the economic downturn, when that came about, that's when the white parents in the neighborhood were like, ooh, shoot, I don't want to pay that private school tuition. And thus, they started to send their kids to PS8 more, and those cheese buses started coming less and less from Fort Greene and Farragut houses. And that's when that change happened. Yes, I remember those principles. I remember we had a very strong PTA. It was always a great school, but guess what? My granddaughter lives across the street at Cadman, Town, at Cadman Plaza. She's a little black girl. She could not get in to PS8. And I wonder, what the heck is that all about? What the heck? Are you saying because of, of kindergarten, the wait list? I'm talking about kindergarten, the right. She could okay. not get in. She couldn't get in for pre-K. She couldn't get into kindergarten. And lives right across the street. And it's the black kid that's been in this, whose family's been in this neighborhood like 26 years. That's crazy to me. Okay. There's a racial problem there. And the next thing that I want to tell you is that, yes, it was better before we had mayoral control. Because before then, we had educators who had some experience. So maybe it, you know, the, the problems with the school boards, that, that, those nine or however many school boards that were corrupt, yeah, throw them away. Let's do something to make that better. But the community had some input. There were eyes and ears from the community who worked in the school so that the neighborhood had some investment in the schools. All of a sudden now we have principals who have been there for, you know, 30-year-old principals who don't know what they're doing. It came out of Leadership Academy or something. They have no idea well, I, how I, to lead. You have a, a lot to say, I do. Benita. I do. And I, we should, to be fair to this mayor, point out that those policies you're referring to of replacing educators with non-educators, that was largely happening under Bloomberg. And this new chancellor has said principals need to have at least seven years experience. I'm so glad to so hear that. So there's been a but change. Here, here both, both our Mayor de Blasio and Chancellor sat on school boards mm -hmm. in, right, in District 15. They sat on the school board. Right. They, that's how they, they came up through the ranks that way. So then you're saying... And now you're... they're saying, well, nobody else can have that opportunity. Democracy is messy, and the community must be involved in their schools. Okay. Yeah. I have a... I want to give Clara an opportunity to respond to what you say, and then I'd like to just ask a general survey question to the audience before we leave. So, so Clara, would you like to respond? Is there any? No, I, I mean I'm always glad to hear different points of view. You know, thank you. Okay. Could I just quickly? I, I do want to honor what you're saying. Um, I I think that you are right. Many black and brown parents are not talking about integration. We know black and brown kids bore the burden of integration. It was them who were bust out of their schools. It was them who lost their teachers and administrators. It was their schools that were closed. So absolutely, I think that like all parents, it, black and brown parents would prefer their kids could go to a local community school and not have to leave the neighborhood to get a quality education. The problem is 
They cannot get it often in their own neighborhoods and they cannot get it in segregated schools. Um, we have not, like I said, we have not broken that link between the resources. So I, I, I understand you should not have to leave your neighborhood to get quality teachers and quality instruction. You absolutely should not. But what we know is that when black and brown kids have been segregated in their own schools, then the teacher who can't get hired anywhere else gets sent to that school. No one's paying attention to the instruction that's happening or not happening in those schools. And so unfortunately, we have often had to leave our communities to get the quality education. But you're right, people, people are not clamoring for this. So with that in mind, I'm curious now, today the mayor laid out a new agenda for the schools in which he wants to devote more resources to literacy, math in the early grades. He wants to have more computer science programs in all elementary schools, potentially. And he, so what he's laying out is a solution for fixing all schools or improving all schools and helping failing schools was what we heard a lot about in the last school year. So with that in mind and what Nicole is saying right now and what we just heard from Benita, how many of you right now believe integration should have been on the mayor's agenda? So I see about half the hands or maybe a little less. How many of you believe that the mayor is correct to focus on fixing all schools and not talk about integration but just focus on putting more resources in these schools? How many of you are confused? <laughs> Good. Okay. Well, then you've given... Every, you on the panel and you in the audience have given yourselves a lot to think about tonight. Thank you so much for everyone.